My name is Sandra Ridley, and I am the author of The Counting House. So the title, The Counting House, comes from uh, an old rhyme, sing a song of sixpence, and the king is in his counting house counting out his money. So that was one of the first poems or the first rhymes that I was looking at, and it's actually a very sinister rhyme, like most rhymes. Uh, there's a lot of darkness in the interpretation behind it, so I started looking at other rhymes and was looking at the interpretations of those, and I found that other rhymes like Ring Around the Rosie or Who Killed Cock Robbins started to infiltrate where I was going with the work. So that was the starting point. He's shoving these blackbirds into a pie or he's having them shoved into a pie and it's all about control and influence and power and he's got such a small kingdom and these blackbirds, some of them live and some don't. Yeah, it was a partly serendipity that I was reading those books at the same time that these poems started to surface. Um, but I'll backtrack a little bit. There was also the Roud Folk Song Index, which is this huge compendium of, I think, 200,000 references to 25 different thousand, uh, 25,000 different uh, folk songs and rhymes and ballads and all the interpretations behind them. And so I spent a lot of time digging through all of those and coming up with um, all of the iterations of darkness that were found in those various rhymes that I was looking at. And then uh, the Foucault, it was Discipline and Punish, that book. And I found that a lot of that book was focusing on discipline, the body, objectification of the body, subjectification, um, influence, power and control, uh, the relationships between those various partners within that domestic unit or that courtyard, and the interplays and forces that are at work there. Part of Foucault's Discipline and Punish book had a huge section based on Bentham's Panopticon, and it was a penal system that was prescribed in the late 1800s, I believe. But the idea of it was that everything was always under the gaze. The body was completely under the gaze at all times, so the, the, the guard in the center tower could see everything happening all the time. And so that I transferred to the domestic household, and I, the characters, if there are characters in this book, were constantly under the gaze. So that might be also another way that the Foucault reading influenced the work. It's uh, the business of transactions and interpersonal relations and the things that are given and taken and the tallyings and recordings and nothing is ever for certain but you're trying to keep a record of things and keeping track of evidence of what's the transactions that are occurring within the domestic household. So economy is very small scale here. It's not the larger economy of the world but um, economy of the household. Well, I'm concerned, or I had been concerned with interpersonal relations on a very small scale. So um, interpersonal relations between the family unit, between lovers, um, the king and the queen. I, I hope that they can be. I had the idea that each one would be a different form of like, like an iteration or a reiteration or a reassessment. So it's a, the text kind of moves forward through time and it goes from indirectness to, to directness, from obscurity to clarity of sorts. A lot of times it's been a, an elemental force and through these particular rhymes that I was looking at, the force tended to be of a feminine nature, a female force within that courtyard or that household. So it was just coming up with a different terminology instead of maiden, what would be the modern equivalent of the maiden? Well, that would be the darling, but it's still the muse. So the muse is still acting as the force of bringing out the poem, but it's also the essence of the poem itself.
think it's in the book typographically in the amount of white space that's there. There's a lot of breadth and movement of the breadth within the text as it's represented on the page. So, and there's a lot of sound play as well, a lot of sounds that are connected throughout the book. And, and I think for me, the first section, I did try to retain a cadence for the oral spoken quality. Um, the second section, I didn't so much, although there is definitely a pulse there, but for the second section, I was more concerned with cr coming up with a parallel way of doing a proper accounting. So that section has text that can be read linearly across the page, but also down within their subsections. So that doesn't necessarily look or work like an oral poem might, and it's difficult to read sometimes to get that uh, column format across. It's impossible. Um, which is why the third section comes across as a, a reiteration of that second section, and it's more into the same cadence of the spoken word. I'm going to read the first two poems from the book. According to and fittingly a break, and our pockets fill with flowers to conceal the smell of dying. Thus concludes the final succumbing to bloody pomander and posy. The only authentic reference being a ring, a ring of roses, moreover and other than this covenant for happiness. Eventually, we would have, oh, we would have. Falling, not always a dropping to the ground, Construed as rhyme, not death, not a literal fall or heartbreak, instead, but any other form of respective bending. Though all evidence points strongly against a worn rose, once, 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 popular conjecture, now complex gossip, continue to writhe. If this is like nothing else, find a different interpretation over time. <laughs> 